No, not dun 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 dun. It's not Darth Vader. It's. <laughs> anyway, we are in First Kings uh, 18 ish, as it says, and um, we'll start into it, get into it, and then. Um, uh, as people trickle in, if people trickle in, they can join in. Please direct them in the right scriptural place. All right, let's, uh, let's pray. Thank you, Father, for bringing us together today. We uh, come and, and once again seek to hear your spirit speak to us and reveal to us through your word the truth that in the words of your son sets us free. And to walk in that freedom, we walk by the spirit, as Paul writes. So may what we learn today and what you reveal to us today, not only settle in our minds, but give glory to who you are in our lives. And this we pray in Jesus' name, amen. This, as we go into it, this section, is a very profound example of something that we talk about frequently, but um, is not all too, all too difficult, all too easy, I should say, to grasp. And the best way to address it is this word kingdom. As we see in all of Jesus' ministry, this is his proclamation, kingdom. If you go back to Moses delivering people out of Egypt, God says through Moses that Israel will be a kingdom of priests and that um, this, is, this has been destined since Abraham. So this is very important to understand because it runs through all of Scripture even when the word itself is not being used. I've said before, and it's good to repeat to let it sink in, without getting too technical, a kingdom is whatever you have say over. That's what a kingdom is. And we read in Genesis that God, in his generosity and in his um, intention, creates us in order for us, being made originally in his image, to share in his reign or having say over. And you see this probably most profoundly in Genesis 2, when God himself brings all of his creatures before Adam and instructs Adam to name them. It's not, there, that is a definite example of sharing kingdom authority. Whenever you name something, you have authority over it, even if it's a pet, you know. You, you, you name your pet and then you teach it to, to come according to its name, and maybe it will listen to you. We have a we had a dog for a while until Spearman took it, and while the dog was living with us, would listen to us, and that was its den, that was its place. It realized that we had say over it and had instruction, and then he's, that dog's moved out, but will come to visit, and when he comes to visit, realizing that this is not his domain where he lives anymore, pays no attention to us. We don't have say over that dog anymore. It's like, come here. <laughs> All right. That's a minor example, but that is an example. Starting with chapter 17 is the introduction of Elijah. And God has say, if you will, or is revealing his word, which has say to Israel through the prophets. And I'm just going to do a little bit of review regarding uh, chapter 17, and then we will continue to delve into this. Because there is nothing worse in existence than not having say 
over what God originally gave you to have say over. Whether not being able to control your thoughts, not being able to control your emotions, or not being able to have control over your body. Those are the things that we, that, that, that we have a very difficult time if we lose say over. And um, we want to go into that today in terms of what that means in following God through Jesus Christ. Chapter 17, however, of 1 Kings says this. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab. Now Ahab is the king, okay? And Ahab is the king not of Judah but of Israel. They're already in rebellion. As the Lord, the God or Elohim of Israel lives, whom I serve... That indicates kingdom. He has say over my, what I say in this regard, whom I serve. If you serve someone, they have say over. So he's, in, in essence, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. This is kingdom language. Elisha has been given say over the elements themselves. Now, it's not individualistic. Elijah doesn't whimsically just decide on his own. He decides what Elijah has say over is determined by what God has say over in Elijah's life. This is a very important, not just principle, but kingdom reality. Remember what we read on Sunday morning. Jesus sent the 12 out and gave them authority. So they were given authority or power to have say over unclean spirits. But that, un, that ability to have say over unclean spirits is directly related by their exercise, if you will, of discipleship, which includes repentance. Repentance is a continuous, not just a study, but a practice of having God have say over your life, over every part of your life. So the practice of having the Lord have say over your life is discipleship. And it starts in, in a very profound manner with the 12 by Jesus saying, drop everything you're doing. And when you drop everything and you follow him, it is in a very practical manner. He is having say over your life, your schedule in particular, 24-7. So Elisha is exercising this. The word of the Lord then in verse 2 came to Elisha. Leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I have ordered the ravens to feed you there. So he does so. This is in contrast, remember, with, with the other um, prophet who was given instructions and said, when you go and you, you prophesy against this altar, you come right back, don't go to the right or left. But another prophet tricked him. This is the exact opposite of this. Um, so, verse 5. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kirith Ravine east of the Jordan and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him. Go at once. Now look at this for a second. Verse 7. Sometime later the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. It's dry. Then the word of the Lord came to him. <coughs> it's not a coincidence that all of a sudden you're out of water. He doesn't freak. He waits on the Lord and then the Lord gave him instructions in that moment. One of the things that the enemy is very skilled at doing 
is to get you to is to replace listening which is key and replaces it with worry you can't do one of these is going to dominate and it's it's impossible to listen to the lord if you are consumed with worry and worry cannot exist when your posturing is listening to the Lord. Those two are a practice. We're practicing doing this. No one perfects it. It's a lifelong practice. So the, the, the brook dries up in verse 7, verse 8. The word of the Lord came to him, go at once to Zarephath of Sidon and stay there. I have commanded a widow in that place to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, And bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread. Only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. Well, that's not helpful. <laughs> now, what, this is a very profound account here. This is what her plan is. She is unable to see beyond her circumstance and then her circumstance dictates her mindset, her emotional stat, her emotional uh, conditioning, and her course of action. Even though the Lord has instructed her to do what she's doing in terms of meeting Elisha, she is unable to see beyond her circumstances and therefore her circumstances are determining what she thinks, feels, and does. It is a condition of slavery. The Jews, to the Jews who had believed in Jesus, he said, if you continue in my word, you are really my disciples. You got to continue. It's a continue. And then, as you continue, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. But it is a process. It's not a certificate program, it's not a, a seminar. It is a lifelong practice and learning. We're going to get into it more. As we go in, as, as uh, we continue with this chapter, Elijah said to her in verse thirteen, "Don't be afraid." So every thought that you have that's of fear, mm -mm. every emotional state that you have this fear, uh -uh. every plan that you have com concocted based on that, that's all gone. Your story that you have created in your mind based on your circumstance is kind of a continuation of Sunday. It's not God's story. Do not try to fit what you think God is going to do into your story. Be open to God's story that he will fit you in. And he wants to fit everyone in because everybody is included. God doesn't bring anybody into existence just willy-nilly without any purpose. They belong. So he goes on, but first make a small cake of bread for me and from what you have, I'm sorry, but first make a small cake of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord gives rain on the land. 
She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. Now this, this is a very similar to Israel coming out of the promised land. And they don't have, they don't have any, anything to eat. And so they complain. And God gives them then manna, bread to eat. Later, Jesus will say, I'm the living bread. Your forefathers ate manna, I'm the living bread. It's his, he's making that, that uh, comparison. But manna is not to be eaten in a haphazard way. You collect it in the morning just for that day. Don't collect any more than what you need. On the sixth day, then you collect what you will need not only for that day, but for the following day, which is the Sabbath, which I've asked you to observe and to rest. And this now is beginning to create a habit because the way you think is a habit, the way you feel is a habit, the way you react is a habit, and if God does not have say over your habits, you are enslaved to them. I'll give you just a quick little example of the learning curve I experienced yesterday. I, I had to do a little bit of banking, not much, but it was more of a question. So I went to the bank. I already had in mind what, I mean, I knew what the question was. I just needed the answer, and the answer is going to give me reassurance over the banking situation that I was inquiring about. So I waited, not a big line. And I get there, and I state my question, and the person says, oh, I can't answer that. You don't have authority. Now, it's probably a good policy that she shared with me for security's sake. But it didn't sit well with me. And by the time I got to my car, I was infuriated. And I didn't, you know, lash out at anybody or anything like that. But when I was in my car, I just let it rip. I just up and down went. And while I was doing that, there was also myself reminding me, you know, God has this in, under control. I didn't care. I am tired, sick and tired of being told God's in control and then this stuff happens to me. I mean, not very long, a few minutes. And then, and in that moment, I realized, yeah, I still have habitual sin. Somewhere in here. And even though I've practiced discipleship, I'm, I still, as Paul says, I carry around in my body this sinful nature. Every day I lay it at the altar and pursue the kingdom best I can, trusting that he's going to do what I can never do. And God in that moment simply reminded me, yeah, you got work to do. I got work to do. It's okay. Just as a reminder, because spiritual it's like anything else. You get If you practice and God allows you to gain some kind of mastery over what you're practicing, it's not difficult to fall into pride or self-illusion. This was not a crisis that I experienced yesterday at all. A crisis, I probably would have been acted completely differently. But this one was petty. Got to be careful for the petty ones. So, here we are. Every day, she gets flour from a jar. Has no idea if it's going to happen the next day. Because God is creating a habit for her. We use terms like post-traumatic stress. 
What is that? It's an event that has been impacted, that has formed now a habit of reaction, mentally, emotionally, physically, that can only be broken sometimes through discipleship. Now, verse 15, she went away and did as Elijah had told her, so there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up, the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. Sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, what do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? This is a mindset. Give me your son, Elijah replied. He took him, he took him from her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying, and laid him on his bed. Then he cried out to the Lord, O Lord, my God, you have brought tragedy also upon this widow I am staying with by causing her son to die. And then he stretched him out. Then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried to the Lord, O Lord, my God, let this boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's cry and the boy's life returned to him and he lived. Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room into the house. He gave him to his mother and said, look, your son is alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is true. Now you know. Now, didn't know with the jar. The jar wasn't enough. Now she says this. This is transformation, kingdom transformation, if you will, with regards to a widow and her son. It's going to expand as we go into chapter 18. Because with that as the backdrop going into 18, after a long time in the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Go and present yourself to Ahab and I will send rain on the land. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab. Now if you remember, when you go to... Um, chapter 17, the Lord said, um, it's going to happen for a few years, but doesn't give the exact um, time frame. So now, and it's, we, we still don't have an exact time frame. It's a long time, the third year, which is a long time. The word of the Lord came to Elijah, go and present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the land. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria. And Ahab had summoned Obadiah, who was in charge of his palace. Obadiah was a devout believer in the Lord. When Jezebel was killing off the Lord's prophets, Obadiah had taken a hundred prophets and hidden them in two caves, 50 in each, and had supplied them with food and water. Ahab had said to Obadiah, go through the land to all the springs and valleys, Maybe we can find some grass to keep the horses and mules alive so we will not have to kill any of our animals. So they divided the land they were to cover, Ahab going in one direction and Obadiah in another. As Obadiah was walking along, Elijah met him. Obadiah recognized him, bowed down to the ground and said, Is it really you, my lord, Elijah? Small l, meaning Elijah has authority. Yes, she replied, go tell your master Elijah is here. Well, what have I done wrong, asked Obadiah, that you are handing your servant over to Ahab to be put to death. As surely as the Lord your God lives, there is not a nation or kingdom where my master has not sent someone to look for you. And whenever a nation or kingdom claimed you were not there, he made them swear they could not find you. But now you tell me to go to my master and say, Elijah is here. I don't know where the spirit of the Lord may carry you when I leave you. If I go and tell Ahab and he doesn't find you, he will kill me. Yet I, your servant, have worshipped the Lord since my youth. Haven't you heard, my Lord, what I did 
while Jezebel was killing the prophets of the Lord. I hid a hundred of the Lord's prophets in two caves, fifty in each, and supplied them with food and water. And now you tell me to go to my master and say, Elijah is here. He will kill me. Elijah said, as the Lord Almighty lives whom I serve, I will surely present myself to Ahab today. Now what you're seeing is a conflict that's coming to a head between God and what he has say over and rebellious foreign gods, idols that represent and are the, the, the influences of rebellious Elohim spiritual beings that rebelled against God and, and, and that conflict between the two. What is happening here is not an abstract academic experience. It is a full life experience. When someone's trying to kill you or threaten you and you have that level of fear, embodies every aspect of your being and the Lord in terms of the kingdom of God remember this is the this is the proclamation that Jesus gave starting even with John the Baptist repentance the kingdom where God has say over is at hand you then repent it is not passive it is active it is not self-contained you can't repent on your own it is still an act of God it's still God doing it but it's not passive we participate so when Jesus gathers his let's say the 12 disciples they follow him they're not going to learn about the kingdom on their own. He's going to teach them, but it's not passive. It's, an, it's, it's every aspect of their life. And it's going to transform every thought that they have, every emotional response that they have, and every aspect of their physical well-being. So when God has say over every aspect of your life, you are free from the effects of the rebellion that has come into this world starting with Adam. Now, one of the things to remember, hold your spot there at chapter 18, is this thing called reigning because we were created to do such a thing. Please turn with me to Psalm 8. Psalm is a powerful psalm. It is a psalm of David. David speaking prophetically. Um, writes this out. This is Psalm 8. O Lord our God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Or, O Lord our Lord. You have set your glory above the heavens from the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place. You got to think about that for, for a second. When he considers this. And, and, and if you're in Jerusalem from the palace, there's no street lights to block the view, right? Full view. And yesterday, we were reading, um, last night, Ben had that devotional, and 
I can't remember, it was like how many billions and billions and billions. The universe is endless. Because now we can see with telescopes. And you look at that and it can make one feel, boy, I am really, 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 really insignificant. And yet the Lord knows every hair on our head. But continuing, when he says this and feels very, 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 very insignificant looking at the wonders of the universe around him. What is man or mankind that you are mindful of him? The son of man. Now that term, son of man, Ben Adam, son of Adam. Ben Adam, son of man that you care for him. You made him son of Adam, Adam's descendants, a little lower than the heavenly beings, or another translation than God. The word is Elohim, again. So if you want to translate that heavenly beings or God, you can. Angels is, a, is a, probably a Septuagint, I mean a Greek translation. And crowned him with glory and honor. Now look at this in verse 6. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. In other words, you made him to have say over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet. <clears throat> he has say over all of that. All flocks and herds and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the sea or seas. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name. David acknowledges in this psalm the creator of the universe originally created Adam to have say over everything in this world. We were to rule it. My translation says rule. You made him ruler, meaning you were to have say. It is our domain that God shares with us that we were to reign with him. When Genesis 3 came into being, that authority was stolen. And the authority was now given to the prince, of, as Paul says, the prince of the air, <coughs> the serpent. And the condition of this now is one of corruption. Everything is in the process of corruption. Meaning, you may take a, a peach and set it there, and it doesn't look like it's corrupting, but give it a few days and it will. Uh, you may go back, if you're a film person, and look at old films with, oh, I don't know, um, an old movie star, um, and look at them now, that's corruption. Was not intended. And in addition to that state of being, or we call it sin, corruption, our authority has been stolen. We don't have authority to say what we want. We can try to use our best abilities with tools, but it's very limited. If there's going to be a drought, there's going to be a drought. If there's going to be disease, there's going to be disease. That authority that we had to reign with God was stolen from us. That's why it's frustrating. And discipleship is learning entirely to realign our selves with the reign of God, with the kingdom of God, where he has say over in order for him to realign our character in order for us to have say over. And it starts with our character. Um, I was going to go to Hebrews, but instead I want to swing over to Romans. 
just head on out that direction. We read it today, but I want to redo, uh, revisit it again. Romans, and let's take a look at uh, let's take a look at chapter five. <laughs> yeah, we were just talking about that because we read it earlier today over in Bel Air. I said, "Gosh, you guys are studying it Saturday morning and." And I think we're covering it someplace else. Anyway, you can't you can't exhaust it. I mean, it's just it's an it's inexhaustible this this letter. But chapter five, Paul says, "Therefore, since we have been justified through faith," uh, that's a big sentence. I don't have time to delve into it. But that be in the, the 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 context. Let us or we have peace with God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And let us rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we, or let us, also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. Okay? Without character, one cannot reign. It's an impossibility. Reigning, have a, having authority over, having say over, is directly proportionate to one's character. You see this even in, in raising children or having a society. Um, for example, driving a car. Wow, now you have say over how much does a car weigh? 2,000 2, pounds of power. You gonna give somebody say over that without character? I mean, no. Because if you do, and they don't have character, they'll do something, hey, text, how you do, ah, boom. Or they'll go out and party and not realize their intoxication level and do something dumb like that. You can't have say over something without character. It will, by virtue of it, the setup, destroy itself. Um, you can't get married until you're a certain age. Why? Character. You can't vote. Character, okay? This is a principle that we see all, all around us. And to reign with God, to have say over, is not just externally, but internally a development of character. And what is a development of character other than learning how to have say over your own thoughts, emotions, reactions, and, and actions based on what God's will is? So Paul can write, I take every thought captive. Every single thought I take captive. I don't let my mind just run willy-nilly. Because if I do, it will go here. I don't let my conversations run willy-nilly. Because all of a sudden, a conversation can easily just go off into gossip. I don't let anything in my life outside of the will of God. It's not passive, it's active, but it all falls under the kingdom. Every single thought. And you think, well, man, that's a lot of work. Yeah, it is. But is it worth it never to worry again? If, if down the road you never have to worry again? Or you don't have to worry near to the degree that you did at one time? Is that, is, that worth, is that worth it to you? Or is it better to go on meds? I mean, not that those things aren't, don't have some value. I'm just saying. And you see this happening with Jesus' disciples. They, they have to think differently. Um... I've given you some, 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 some examples Jesus gives them. Now, 
Peter, let's see if you can walk on water. Oops. I came for a little bit. And each one of us are having examples of walking on water. Usually, it's always, as Paul says in this letter, we rejoice in our sufferings. It's always sufferings because a situation of suffering is what brings to the surface, starting with the physical as well as mental, everything of, it, it tests us. Suffering tests us. And a test is always designed to see what's in there. If you're going to give a test, if I'm teaching you history, and I've lectured all week or whatever, and I'm going to give you a test because I want to see how much you know. And um, I'll be able to tell how much you know by the test that I give you. If I don't give you any tests and you just show up and you get an A, I don't know what's, what, what you picked up or not. So a test is already is, is, is designed to reveal what's within you. Jesus says, in this world, you will have trials. You will have tests. And it will reveal what's within you. And in discipleship, learning that he has say over everything, we learn how to have say over our own thoughts, over our own emotions, over our own reactions, so that we're not pushed or pulled by what anyone else says. If nobody showed up at this Bible study but one person, I wouldn't have a, I'm still doing, I'm doing it because God told me to. Regardless of what the circumstances may be. We cannot be disappointed. There's no disappointment in the kingdom at all. Disappointment comes from when we create a, a standard or an expectation apart from God's will, and then we get let down because our expectation didn't get met. That's what God revealed to me yesterday. You, I, you just had this expectation it was going to take, boom. And you were so, and God just did it perfectly. Set me up just perfectly. I went into the bank, not even a line. You know, when you're thinking, ah, it could be a big line. I've been here where there's a big line. Not a line. So now you're even more happy. <laughs> right? Oh, this is going great. I'm going to be in and out. And <laughs> What do you mean, Kendra? Okay, well, thanks for your help. That was there like the whole time. Just needed the right circumstances to come out. I know God's in charge. I didn't care. Because I wasn't in charge. And for that moment, thank God, there was nobody around. I could just be, I got to order a new steering wheel now because it's all bent. But <laughs> No, I don't have to. <laughs> but um, th this is because until we learn how God has say over every all of our thoughts, our reactions, our emotions, our actions, we can't be ha we can't handle having rain over anything. God can only give us so much based on our character. So, when Peter says to, to, to God, to Jesus, I don't care what anyone else does. I'm not leaving. I'll die for you. I'll die right now. I believe he truly believed that and felt that, but didn't know what was in him. And so Jesus says, not condemningly, yeah, you're going to deny me. And when, you're, when you've done that, go back and strengthen your brothers. Don't, don't, don't shoot one another for, for each other's failings. Oh, a Christian failed? Get out. Set another one up on a pedestal that we can... No, it doesn't work that way. It's we're all here to build each other up. And if there's a f failing, then join the crowd and continue on. But this is very important, this kingdom thing. And it's not just theoretical. When we go, we're going to go back to... Uh, Kings, uh, 1 Kings 18 again. Ahab fully embodies rebellion 
And that rebellion isn't just a stubbornness of will. It is a hatred of God and God's rightful authority. Of, it is a hatred of being dependent on God. It is, is a, a hatred of God's rightful role in the universe. And therefore, it's a hatred of everything good and true and, 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 and positive, if you want to put it, in the light. It's a hatred of all that. And so it will always come out in its, as a manifestation of murder. So as we grow in discipleship, the enemy will try even more fervently to tear us down. Sometimes that'll be if your weakness is physical. Uh, I've known people that have, were, you know, going, you know, all, all systems go, all six cylinders running, and then they, they came down with something that left them almost bedridden, and nobody could, nobody could figure it out. Well, now what are you going to do? Every single moment every, of every single minute of every single hour is a, is a, is a battle. No, I'm not going to get disappointed. No, I'm not going to get discouraged. No, I'm not going to. But that is a huge battle. God's in control of my body. He'll heal me when he does. And in the meantime, I'll wait. Yeah, but look at these other people. I mean, the enemy is just relentless. Don't you want to be like this servant? They're up and maybe God doesn't favor you as much because look at this person. Oh, just the accusations, 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 accusations. This is discerning, as Paul says, we're learning to discern between the spirits. So what's happening in, in, in 1 Kings chapter 18 is the battle that we all face individually and even collectively in our own lifetimes at various, in various stages and situations. Verse 16 of chapter 18 of 1 Kings. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. When he saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, you trouble of Israel? See, he just makes accusations already. Accusations and threats. I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the balls. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel. That's an interesting thing. They have a, I don't know if it's a monastery, whatever it is there, that's on top of, the, of that mountain now. And bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. And so you have this, this battle between who are you going to listen to? If the Lord says, I know every hair on your head and I care for you, then no matter what physical diagnosis comes down, it, the diagnosis, it, diagnosis itself is a certain reality, but how we react to it, how we think about it, and how we feel about it is all under our control. If we learn how to listen to God and allow him to have say over our thoughts. Either God's word is true or it's not. When Jesus says, and lo, I am with you always even to the end of the age. Either it's true or it's not. It's true or it's not even if you come down with something or even if there's a, a tragedy or whatever the case may be it's still true and learning how to 
recognize thoughts for what they are. And I, I remember I had was just talking to a relative of mine, and they had to put distance between one of their siblings because it's never good, never good. But, you know, they're siblings. So something happened in the family. They started talking about it. And, and then she started sharing. And I said, that's it. You don't share with that person. They're not trustworthy, never have been. But I know you want that connection. You really, who doesn't want that connection? But you know this. They don't know God. They don't serve God. They go against God. And they will poison everything they touch. You know it. But there's always that that temptation because you want to be close to your family. And there was a little bit of, oh, yeah, that's that's hard. But that's nothing, that's not odd in terms of if you take a look at Jesus' life and his own brothers and sisters, his own mother for a period of time, did not believe in him. So um, that, 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 that is, that, is, um, that is a skill that God gives each one of us over time that allows us to walk in faith. Is faith emotional? Nope. Yes? Is faith, I mean, faith is loyalty. Faith is a skill. I'll give you an example. Um, talking about a skill. Let's say I'm going to teach you all how to play piano. Let's just say, go with me, all right? And, and, and now I've been teaching you for six months, eight months. I'm so proud of you. Ching, 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 ching. And we're going to do a recital. And I got a program set up. Do you have faith, confidence, in performing. That's like faith. And then, okay, if you practiced a lot, you probably have more confidence or faith. If you didn't, you probably have less confidence or faith. And even if you practiced a lot, you've got a lot of faith, the idea of being in front of people may just take all that faith away. But the more you practice, the more you develop faith as a skill. As a, so that every aspect of your thought, your responses, your everything is in alignment with your faith. This is why people can have faith in Jesus at the beginning of his ministry without having any doctrine about him at all taught to them. They just, they had confidence in him. And they practiced that. And every time they had faith in him, he would tell them in some way, shape, or form to exercise that. How do you exercise that? Go into resist. How do you exercise anything? You go into resistance. You always lean into resistance. The worst thing for any Christian is the temptation of being comfortable because it's an illusion. There is no comfortable there's just a continuous transformation that in the midst of discomfort, we can have peace that transcends our ability to understand why we even have peace. You know, the, now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your what? Hearts? Yes. Now may the peace of God, which we can't figure out at all, Keep your emotions and your thoughts, where? In Christ Jesus our Lord. Very profound. I don't know if that was a blessing at the end of the service one time or not. But it was great. It, it just, I think it was a blessing that was part of the liturgy at one time. Because I heard it repeatedly. It was really powerful. So, this, this is all playing itself out, this, this kingdom reality that we're involved in. Everything, and, and, and 
<laughs> and you're not done until we're not done learning this, just practicing this until our time here is done, which is why Paul refers to it as a race. I want to finish this race. I want to go to, I don't need to be first, but I want to finish it. I don't want to train and, 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 and get to a certain place and then just give up on God. Because he won't give up on us. That's a thing. Ooh, ran a little bit late. Okie dokie. We will uh, pick it up next week. <clears throat> Break for a few minutes and then if uh, there's uh, those that uh, want to pray, we'll do that. Lord, thank you for your word. You truly are transforming us hour by hour, day by day, circumstance by circumstance, season by season. And as we're being transformed, we stand in awe of your goodness, of your faithfulness, of your truth that truly does set us free. As we go through this week, may all that we think and say and do give glory to who you are. In Jesus' name, amen.